Members, we turn to our order paper where we have now reached item two questions and I call on Mr Morehouse to ask question one. Thank you Mr President. I would like to ask the Treasury Minister what consideration has been given to the introduction of a rates escalator to increase the amount payable on void and derelict properties. Treasury Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr President. This issue has not been considered by Treasury to date. However, other departments across government have considered, in general terms, the reforms that may be required to our built environment development processes. The concept of initiatives to encourage occupation of empty properties and disincentives against retaining them empty is likely to be referenced in any report that arises out of these considerations. I am aware that the Housing and Communities Board Action Plan, which will be discussed by this Honourable Court later today, has a vibrant communities work stream. This work stream aims to ensure that brownfield sites and empty and derelict properties are developed appropriately and sensitively. One of the actions listed by the Board is an Empty Properties Initiative, which the plan says will include rates and tax incentives for brownfield, empty and derelict, and conservation area housing. Treasury will be pleased to work with the Board as it, as it delivers its Empty Property Initiative. Thank you, Mr President. Supplementary, Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr President. Thank you, Mr President, for that reassurance. Um, Given the challenging high street environment at the moment and owners' reluctance to shift the <coughs> usage of their property, is this one mechanism that could potentially encourage owners to actually be more willing to look at the alternatives? Thank you, Mr President. Mr. Minister, to reply. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I know this is something that has been discussed and talked about before. <coughs> I think um, one, uh, one of his predecessors in this chamber, the, um, the humble member at the time, Mr, uh, Mr. Gorn, I think at one point um, raised uh, the issue around a rates um, escalator. Um, obviously, the usage of property is currently led by market forces. And we recognise that it is a challenge in time for retail and office accommodation. And Treasury has noticed in recent planning applications that owners and occupiers have been seeking changes to use in relation to high street and office buildings, such as residential use. Treasury has not considered this or any alternatives at this time. However, I do refer the honourable member to that part of my answer in which I mentioned the Empty Properties Initiative, which is to include rates and centres for brownfield, empty or derelict properties and conservation conservation area housing and Treasury is more than willing to become involved in the progression of that plan. Supplementary, Mr Thomas. Uh, thank you Mr President and to the uh, Treasury Minister for that um, helpful answer. I think officers were pleased to work with Treasury officers to, pre to prepare it and in that sense uh, as Chair of the Housing and Community Board I welcome the uh, prioritisation of uh, rates reform at least in this aspect back into the um, and it's back in the island plan. Minister Hooper's wishes are fulfilled. Um, the, the question is that uh, I think I, might, I must have misheard the Treasury Minister because um, I think the Treasury Minister said that rates escalators and the use of this type of rates thing hadn't been considered in Treasury before. Surely it has been considered um, in previous reports back, back in 2014 or 2004 or 2007. There's nothing new about this idea. Minister to reply. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. The answer I have in front of me is that the issue hasn't been considered by Treasury to date. Um, certainly by, during this Treasury period, and certainly I think under the last, it certainly wasn't considered. Um, I did make reference to the fact that uh, a former Honourable Member of this Court, I think Mr Gorn, raised <coughs> that, and of course the Honourable Member has much more backdated knowledge than I do of when this will probably have been raised in the past. Um, you know, I, I think um, in terms of it, it is potentially an option that could be looked at, and as I've said, I look forward to working with the Honourable Member and the um, Housing Board to ensure that we can deliver the best that we can. I spent two years of my time in local authority, Mr <coughs> President, as Chairman of what was then the Douglas Council Public Works Committee, um, which dealt with derelict um, and void properties around Douglas. Um, the legislation I always found at that time was unwieldy. I would personally <coughs> say it's still unwieldy now, um, and it's something that we need to address. Final supplementary, Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, does the current system simply encourage property owners to mothball properties and potentially, in some areas, leave them for many years because of legal disputes and things that it's easier just to let them remain as they are because 
there's no real push, no, no real cost to actually leaving the CR. Thank you, Mr. President. <coughs> Minister to reply. Um, thank you, Mr. President. I've got to say, personally, I've always found it. I mean, I think uh, it could be seen that there's too many properties being mothballed. Personally, I've always found that a bit surprising, as it's surely not actually in the interest of the property owners to mothball a property, um, as property <coughs> tends to be a rather expensive thing, and obviously it can deteriorate quite quickly. Now, there is powers, and I referred to the legislation, Mr. President, under the Building Control Act and the Local Government Miscellaneous Provisions Act, um, which empower local authorities to take action for making a building safe and carry out works in order to safeguard the public. Um, obviously, some local authorities use those powers in some ways and others use, take a different approach, is the diplomatic thing I would say. Um, as I have said, I have my own personal views on this. If anyone goes back to when I was a local authority member, I was quite vocal on the issue of void properties and what I believe powers I believe local authorities should have. My views have not changed on that matter um, and I believe personally and it is a personal view, the local authorities should have the ability for compulsory purchase if a property um, remains derelict for some time. But I should say that is a personal view, and it would need to have a court process behind it to ensure that they couldn't um, just simply take a property for no reason. But that's a very much a personal view, Mr President. We move on to question two. Call on the Honourable Lauder. Could I ask the Treasury Minister what the target timescale is for convening a mental health or social security tribunal on receipt of a case? Treasury Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. Can I thank the Speaker for the question? Um, the General Registry, rather than Treasury, has responsibility for convening, administrating, and co coordinating appeals and tribunals. Um, however, I have been able to liaise with the General Registries to gather the information required to respond to the question. The Mental Health Review Tribunal can receive appeals under several different sections of the Mental Health Act 1998. The Mental Health Review Tribunal Rules 2000 require that the Tribunal must convene within seven days of receipt of an appeal in respect of a patient detained for assessment under Section 2 of the Act, which may be the first occasion when the patient has been detained under the Act to allow for assessment of their mental health. Outside of this requirement, the rules make no specific provision for timescales within which a hearing must be held following the submission of an appeal to the Tribunal. In circumstances where no timescale is included within the legislation, the Mental Health Review Tribunal works to a timescale of six to eight weeks within which it will aim to facilitate a hearing. In the case of appeals to the Social Security Appeal Tribunal, no timescale is laid down in legislation or rules in respect of the period between receipt of an appeal and the hearing of the matter. This tribunal also works to a timescale of six to eight weeks within which it will aim to facilitate a hearing of the appeal. Thank you, Mr. President. Supplementary, Lord. Could I, I appreciate that this question has gone to the Treasury Minister as the political sponsor for the General Registry in terms of its legislation. Um, and that legislation, where that legislation doesn't actually specify the seven days, <coughs> does the Minister really believe that six to eight weeks is adequate for this vulnerable section of our community? And that in this sense, justice delayed is justice denied. And will he return to the General Registry uh, to seek either legislation or at least guidance? To, to bring forward those target timescales for convening tribunals, because six to eight weeks, to me, sir, um, Mr. President, does not seem adequate for these, this vulnerable uh, group and the stresses that they will face in that long timescale. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm more than happy to revert back to the General Registries. Um, I am aware, and I've been made aware by General Registries, that there is, of course, in convening a tribunal, um, various processes that have to go through. So, for instance, in relation to the mental health side of things, there will be involvement, for instance, of Manx Care um, to prepare and collate the relevant paperwork from across their areas, and also ensuring the availability of appropriate clinicians and other professionals. Um, there's the distribution of said information to the tribunal appellant and other relevant individuals and parties, and also the preparation and submission of any responses in relation to the information supplied, um, and also to allow, of course, the opportunity for legal representatives to be appointed. Um, and there's also the giving of notice of the hearing to relevant parties, which I believe ordinarily must not be less than 14 days. But I am more than happy, Mr President, to go back and speak further to the general registries around this. Supplementary Lord. Could I... Um Will the Minister accept that if seven day, it, this can be achieved in seven days for Section 2 issues, that it could be achieved a lot faster than six to eight weeks for other issues? And will he return to this, house, uh, uh, or, sorry, to this court at some future date 
with a progress report as to what is being done to reduce that time scale down from six to eight weeks to something that people can um, manage at a very vulnerable time in their lives when dealing with mental health tribunals and social security tribunals. Thanks. Minister to reply. Mr President, as I've said, I'm more than happy to go away to the general registries um, to speak with them and then obviously when there's something to report to come back to honourable members and update them. Move on to question three and I call the honourable order. Uh, good morning, Rector. Again, ask the Minister for Treasury. Uh, further to his written answer of the 29th of April 2022 to written question W. 2022-010168, what plans he has for a more ambitious target for the processing of income tax assessments? Treasury Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr President. Targets should be both realistic and achievable, yeah. which the current targets set out in the Treasury Department Plan 2223 for processing at least 95% of actionable assessments by the 31st of March 2023 is considered to be. This target is for all types of assessments, non-corporate and corporate taxpayers. I am assuming for the purposes of this answer that the Honourable Member is more interested in the processing of individual tax returns and therefore I will concentrate on these. The Income Tax Act 1970 provides that individual tax returns must be submitted to the Assessor of Income Tax by the 6th of October each year. The Income Tax Division receives over 56,000 individual income tax returns each tax year and each of these returns requires an assessment. The Income Tax Division processes income tax returns during the whole year in order to issue the vast number of assessments. There has to be a balance between quantity and quality for processing of assessments, in particular ensuring that the right tax is collected at the right time. As I stated in my written answer of the 29th of April, every employer at the end of each tax year is required to submit an annual return of their employee's remuneration and tax deducted, which requires verification and crediting against the accounts of the relevant individual taxpayers. An individual's tax assessment can only be issued when the verification process for their own remuneration, occupation or pension has been completed. This means that returns received in April and May, for example, may not be able to be processed immediately due to incomplete verification. Looking further at the tax returns for 2020-21 received from April 21 onwards, 45% of those returns, so in other words over 25,000 returns, were received in September and October alone. Alongside the pattern by which returns are received, the time to process individual returns is impacted by both the completeness and complexity of the return. Where an assessment is not actionable and it is necessary for the Income Tax Division's officers to raise queries, the issue of that assessment may be delayed. Taking all of these points into consideration, I have at present, Mr President, no plans to ask the Income Tax Division to reconsider the current target for the processing of income tax assessments. Supplementary lawyer. <coughs> Would the Minister not accept that the, the current target is not only achievable, it's bordering on lazy, in as much as it says that 95% of actionable assessments will be done by April next year? Now, my understanding is that, in accordance with his answer, actionable assessments are those where the Treasury has all the information that it uh, needs in order to process the return. I can understand why he wouldn't be wanting to give uh, deadlines for, for those that don't have all the information, but in terms of those that are actionable assessments, to have only 95% of them done within uh, potentially a year of submission for those who, who submit them very promptly, would the Treasury Minister not accept that that represents um, potential risk to the revenue in terms of not getting money in earlier than it would be uh, having, but also uh, not giving money pe uh, back to people who are owed it by the Treasury? Minister to reply. Thank you very much, Mr President. In relation to this question, I'm afraid I wouldn't concur with the Honourable Speaker about lazy. Um, as I stated in my answer, in fact, if you actually look at the profiling of when income tax returns are received, um, if you total it up between those that are received between September and March, totals on average around about 50% of returns. Um, there is a, there, that, is, that is quite a substantial amount, so that's over 25,000 returns received in that period. I believe that the 95% is an adequate target, but obviously, Mr President, the one thing I would say is that we should always be striving to do better across the whole of government and that, we to, and that where that target can be exceeded, then it most certainly should be worked to exceed that target. Supplementary, Lorda. Uh, I, mean, I do wonder if the Treasury Minister undermines his own argument in as much as if 45% if have received in September or October, by that point, occupational uh, pension, or, uh, pension arrangements will have been received at that point, um, which seems to be the, the excuse for not doing things faster. Um, would the Minister accept that if 
all the information is in the hands of the Treasury, that there is no excuse for um, the Treasury to take more than, say, three months in actually processing an individual's income tax return. Minister to reply. Thank you very, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Of course, we have to ensure that any assessment is correct, as I said in my original answer, and that the amounts collected are correct as well at the right time. Um, so, as I say, at the moment, I have no intention of reviewing the 95% target. Um, but, as I say, we should always be working to exceed that target where we can, Mr. President. On a supplementary order. Yeah, I, I, I do wonder whether the, the Treasury Minister really did grasp the last part of the question about whether he thought it was acceptable in having had all the information that it was in any way justifiable to take more than three months to process an application. Minister to reply. Um, thank you very much, Mr. President. I do apologise. I did actually miss that part of the Honourable Member's question. Um, I would personally say that if all the information is in place, then there, should, then there should be no reason, personally, I would say, that an application should take over three months. And if the Honourable Member has any specifics, I will happily take it away and have them looked at for them. Sounds like a target to me. Let me move on to question four. Call on the Honourable Member for Garth. Mrs Kane. Thank you, Mr President. I would like to ask the Minister for Health and Social Care what progress there has been with developing a combined ME, CFS and Long Covid service, and if he will make a statement. Call on the Minister for Health and Social Care to reply. Thank you very much, Mr President. Ranks Care are developing an integrated and multidisciplinary ME, CFS and Long Covid service that will be able to support clinicians across primary care to make an early diagnosis and appropriate referral to the specialist service that will be delivered by trained staff to understand the condition who are able to undertake a comprehensive assessment and initiate targeted interventions. The service is aimed to be non-judgmental, reviewing the patient's needs and developing a plan of care with that patient. And it will be a service that other services can learn from and understand how these conditions can impact on people's lives. The scope of the service is to provide a consistent and integrated offer to the ME, CFS and long COVID population on the Isle of Man, with some <coughs> aspects of their care provided off-island when specialist care or advice is required, such, such as perhaps immunology. The service will include adults and children taking into consideration the feedback that was collated at the listening events held for both patient groups in February and March of this year. One of the deliverables of the service will be training for healthcare professionals who will be interacting with those living with these conditions, for example nurses or social care workers, paramedics and hospital-based consultants. Other deliverables will include fully staffed specialties for the MDT service, an agreed plan of care in place for each patient referred to the service, leaflets and information for other services in various mediums to inform the wider public, and a dedicated project team that includes all the expertise required to fully inform the requirements of the service. Mr President, to date, Manx Care has appointed a dedicated service development lead to take forward the project at PACE, who will work alongside a full-time project clinician, who will provide the clinical expertise to develop clinical pathways based on nice guidelines and nuance to fit our circumstances and patient and service user feedback. This project clinician role will be a job share between our two existing specialist therapists, who are both working with the ME, CFS or long COVID patients. In addition, two patient information leaflets have been developed in-house for patients who have suffered COVID-19 to provide advice as to how to manage any long-term effects of COVID, such as ongoing smell or taste changes, breathlessness. The second of these leaflets will be upload uploaded to the Long COVID website in the next week. <coughs> also close to completion is our communication strategy for the project, as well as a draft suite of job descriptions for professionals and support staff who will work in the new service. Finally, Mr. President, there is an open offer from ME Support Isle of Man to assist with training for government departments, and Manx Care will be collabor collaborating closely with the charity to offer training to other government departments. Supplementary, Mrs. Kane. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank the Minister for, for that detailed answer. And could he clarify a couple of points? Can he confirm um, the amount, if, if uh, Treasury funding has been secured to set up this service, and when it will be operational for adults and children to access. <coughs> Mr. To reply. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, yes, I can confirm Treasury funding was secured as part of the budget. It is included in the pink book. I can't remember off the top of my head the exact amount, but it was in the region of £400,000, I believe. Uh, in terms of when the service will be offered, the long COVID service is currently up and running patients can be referred into it. Uh, this is a further development and enhancement of that existing service and the implementation timeline uh, for this enhanced service is from July of this year. Supplementary, Mr Glover. 
Does the Minister have any idea just how many cases of long COVID have been referred here on the island? Minister to reply. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, no, I don't. That is outside the scope of the original question, so I don't have that information with me. I will ask and find out and circulate that answer. Supplementary, Mrs Kane. Thank you, Mr President. Um, the Minister said there would be training. Um, can he confirm that GPs will also receive training in this area, including diagnostic support and referral pathways. I'm still hearing um, anecdotal evidence from constituents that actually that they're not receiving the best advice or being believed when they report with symptoms. Um, will people be able to self-refer to the service when it is fully up and running? Minister to reply. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, as I said in the original answer, training will be offered for all healthcare professionals who will be interacting with individuals living with these conditions. That will include uh, GPs. It is concerning uh, to hear from the Honourable Member uh, that that is not uh, being well received at the moment. So if she has any instances, uh, please pass that on to my department and we can investigate. But also I would strongly encourage members of the public who don't feel they're getting uh, an adequate level of service from any area of the health and care service to raise that formally through the complaints process or to pick up the, uh, the phone and talk to the Manx Care Advice and Liaison Team to provide that feedback directly to those clinicians on the ground. Supplementary, Mrs Kane. Thank you and thank the Minister for that offer. Um, just in terms of how the service is being established and run, when the service project lead contract finishes, I think he said there would be a job, care, job share between the two existing health professionals. Does he think that that will be adequate to maintain the service? And another point he mentioned about learning lessons from this project that could be applied to the transformation of other Manx care services, does he have in mind any particular services that it might be applied to? Minister to reply. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, no, I, I don't believe that uh, the current setup will be adequate, which is the whole purpose of the project, to develop and enhance the existing uh, service into something much broader than we currently have on offer. Uh, that's the whole purpose of the project. I don't have any specific examples of other services that could be <coughs> this kind of close collaboration with non-profits, with uh, patients and service users, but actually, I think as a core principle, I would say every service could benefit from more engagement with patients and service users. Move on to question five. Call on the Honourable Member for Garth, Mrs Kane. Thank you, Mr President. I'd like to ask the Minister for Health and Social Care how Manx Care is increasing public awareness of post-viral recovery techniques which could reduce the risk of exacerbating long COVID symptoms and to what extent it has collaborated with any other departments on this. Minister for Health and Social Care to reply. Thank you very much, Mr President. In February 2022, Manx Care developed a dedicated long COVID online resource page, which is housed within the central government COVID-19 website. <coughs> this website contains a background on what long COVID is, a list of the most common symptoms, a summary on self-management, and a number of links to both internal and external resources. One of the links is to a leaflet developed in-house by the Manx Care Long COVID Therapy Team, which is a small eight-page booklet providing guidance which helps manage initial COVID-19 symptoms, optimizing nutrition and hydration, fatigue, including rest, sleep, and energy conservation, a staged resumption of exercise, returning to work, and managing mental health and well-being. External links include the NHS My COVID Recovery website, as well as resources from the Scottish Intercollegiate Guidance Network and the British Lung Foundation, amongst others. The website also provides information on how to seek further help on Ireland, which is via primary care, and acknowledges the work ongoing to develop a more comprehensive long COVID service on the island that was covered by my previous answer. In addition to the resources currently available on the website, a more detailed 27-page leaflet, again developed in-house by the Long COVID Therapy Team, will shortly be published, which will provide information on managing the fatiguing effects of Long COVID and some common effects of the condition, such as strategies to improve breathing and ways to counteract changes to taste and smell. This leaflet, which will also be printed and included in GP practices and other community facilities, will provide links to more detailed resources within each section, linking again to the NHS My COVID Recovery website or other specialist websites. With regard to working with other departments, Manx Care have engaged with Public Health, who have assisted in reviewing the dedicated online information. Supplementary, Mrs. Kane. Thank you, Mr. President. I do note the number of resources on the Long COVID webpage, um, but can I just clarify, the Minister? I think the webpage mentions that the service, the enhanced service, will be up and running in September, and I think he said it would be July in his previous answer, so that would be good for people to be aware of. And in terms of um, current resources, 
I am aware there is an open offer from ME Support Isle of Man to assist with training for government departments. Does he know if Manx Care will be collaborating with the charity to provide training to other departments? And has Public Health provided Manx Care with any support regarding these initiatives? Minister to reply. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Yes, in my previous answer, I said that the service implementation would begin from July. The implementation and evaluation phase is uh, time to run from July to September, so that is correct. Again, in my previous answer, I concluded by acknowledging the open offer from ME Support Isle of Man to assist with training for government departments and confirmed Manx Care will be collaborating with the charity to offer this training. Like I said, that was already covered in my previous answer. <coughs> Supplementary, Mr. Glover. Where am I, Dr. Uh, the Minister helpfully mentioned one of the leaflets that were out. It was a, meant to be a series of three leaflets originally. mentioned that the second one was due. But is he happy that <coughs> two years into the pandemic, only a third of that work for information has been completed? Minister to reply. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I, I think I'm already on record uh, as saying that I'm not particularly happy with the speed that this has progressed. Uh, I am, however, reassured by the fact that Manx Care have appointed a service development lead and this project is now progressing at pace. Do I think this is something that should have happened a year and a half ago? Yes, it is something I think that should have happened much sooner, but uh, as we've already talked about this morning, you can't change the past, so the, the aim now is to get this service up and running as quickly as we can. Supplementary, Mrs. Kane. Thank you, Mr. President. And while I um, appreciate the Minister's answer that he's aware of the offer of ME support to offer training to government departments, I appreciate the offer has been made. Does he know if any of those departments have taken up that offer and will be benefiting from such training? Minister to reply. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, again, as I have said twice now, that open offer uh, from Manx Care, they will be collaborating <coughs> with the charity to offer and deliver this training to other departments. I'm not sure at which phase this is at. I'm not aware of any department having accepted or rejected at this stage, uh, but the offer will be made, uh, and I would expect other government departments to uh, eagerly uh, accept the offer for any support and help that we can provide for their staff and other employees. Move on to question six. I call on the Honourable Member for Arbury Castletown Mr. Morehouse. Thank you, Mr. President. I would like to ask the Minister for Health and Social Care why only one of the seven consultation evenings on autism is taking place outside Douglas. Thank you. Minister for Health and Social Care to reply. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, the seven drop-in sessions which supplement the Department's consultation on developing a national autism strategy are being held in partnership with organisations which are able to provide support in meeting the needs of people with communication differences, and that is what's been determined, that, that is what's determined the places for these specific sessions. The Department is working together with two service providers, these are Autism Initiatives and Crossroads, and one family support organisation, Autism in Man as well as the public health team at University College Isle of Man to encourage and facilitate participation from those who may otherwise find it difficult to respond to the consultation online. The consultation is open to the public for six weeks and is hosted on the government's online consultation hub and available in paper copy or other formats on request. In addition to this, paper copies of the consultation are available from all three wellbeing partnerships in the north, west and south of the island, where our Manx Care colleagues will be happy to support people who would prefer to go through the questions with somebody face-to-face -face in these different geographical locations around the island. Supplementary, Mr Moorhouse. Thank you, Mr President, and thank you for that last slide about the alternatives. Um, given the nature of the challenges many autistic people face, does Manx Care recognise that these people are likely to require less support if they are in familiar surroundings, and I think, in a way, that recognition was coming through in the final element of the answer in terms of identifying other options and <coughs> places where these people could go. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, yes, that is acknowledged, which is exactly why the department has partnered with Autism Initiatives, Crossroads, and Autism in Man, organisations that individuals will already be very familiar with and hopefully have contact with and be familiar with their premises, which is again the driving factor behind the locations of these support sessions. Uh, one thing I would say, uh, Mr. President, just so that there is no doubt here, if anyone does have queries, questions, thinks they will have difficulty filling in the consultation, uh, please get in touch with the department and we will see what we can do to help. Mr. Morehouse. Thank you, Mr. President. And again, thank you for that reassurance because some people are quite concerned. Um, the Minister did appear to consider the Civic Centre in Castletown as a venue, but expressed concern about the availability of people to support the event. Um, how many people does Manx Care require to support such an initiative? Thank you very much. 
Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I have not considered the Civic Centre in Castletown, nor have I expressed any such concerns. The Honourable Member uh, did email me asking, uh, with the offer was there from Castletown Commissioners, that we could use the Civic Centre. Uh, but as I've said in, in the answer, the reason we are using some of these other areas is to uh, work in partnership with organisations that are very familiar with people that do have autism and are familiar with the, the communication challenges that are being faced by some of those people. Uh, that, that, that is, again, what is driving the locations of these. These are places that people are familiar with, like the Honourable Member has already alluded to, with staff they are already familiar with that can provide the right type of support in the right locations. Uh, so this is not about uh, just trying to open a consultation and set up random uh, drop-in sessions all over the place. This is about making sure these are properly supported consultation engagement sessions. And like I have already said, Mr President, if anyone feels unable to access these sessions, unable to access the consultation for whatever reason, please get in touch with the Department directly and we will try and facilitate support as best we can. We move on to question seven. Call on the Honourable Member for Garth, Mrs Kane. I would like to ask the Minister for Infrastructure what the legal position on the use of e-scooters on roads is and whether his department's policy on private or rented e-scooters is under review. Minister for Infrastructure to reply. Thank you very much, Mr President. The use of electric scooters is currently illegal on the public highway on the Isle of Man. I can confirm that the Department is develop, developing a policy on e-scooters and considering potential legislation in order to create a regulated environment for the use of e-scooters. The Department has undertaken a public consultation and is currently consulting with the Department of Home Affairs. It would not be appropriate for me to predetermine the Department's position at this time in respect of the likely policy outcome, but the draft used for the public consultation is available on the Government's consultation portal. The details of the potential policy are still evolving and no firm decisions have yet been taken. If the Department decides to proceed with regulations, Timwald approval will be required and a member's briefing will be arranged before the matter is brought to Timwald. Privately owned e-scooters are already on the island and available for sale on the island. In the UK, it is estimated there are now over 1 million privately owned e-scooters and there is a rapid growth in this market. In respect to the final mile of the journey, they bring the promise of convenience, fun, affordability and environmental sustainability. <coughs> but as with any emerging technology, they also present some risk and safety must be considered. That said, this technology is here and is likely to become the normal means of transport for a lot of people, and we should not ignore this. Thank you, Mr President. Supplementary, Mrs Kane. Thank you, Mr President. I thank the Minister for his answer and, and the appreciation of um, the public demand to be able to use e-scooters. I have a constituent contact me who, while it might be illegal to use e-scooters on public highway, he obtained one and queried whether he should use it and was told that a blind eye would be turned. So can he confirm it's illegal to use them on the public highway and also pavements, or are they permitted on pavements? In terms of a regulated environment, he will be aware that the Queen's speech last week indicated that the uh, e-scooters would be... Um, legalised in some form in the UK and will he be awaiting to see what is included in their transport bill and do similar or different for the Isle of Man? Does he think the Isle of Man could be more innovative in this area? Thank you Mr President. Minister to reply. Thank you Mr President. Uh, whether we'll be more inno innovative than across the water we'll have to wait and see and we'll see what the policy comes out with. Uh, as with regards to riding them on the highway at the moment or the pavement at the moment, I would say that is illegal, that is part of the highway, uh, and I would say they shouldn't do it. That said, I watched two youngsters having the time of their lives on Peel Promenade last weekend. Why? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> is that you, Mr Speaker, was it? Sorry. Um, I, watched, I watched these two lads on the promenade having the time of their lives on their scooters. They then proceeded to go up Walpole, which is the right way to go, turned around and came back down. As they got to the bottom of Walpole on the left-hand side of the road, they were coming down the wrong way against the traffic and faced a vehicle coming around, and I just thought I was about to see a double fatality. So we absolutely need to take care on what, uh, on what we do with this, but uh, they are here to stay, and I think and the Department is discussing, as I said, with the Home Affairs at the moment. Supplementary, Mr Mercer. Thank you, Mr President. Um, would the Minister agree with me that the potential benefits including any environmental and health benefits, and also that relative harms comparing this form of transport against others must be taken into account in the forthcoming review. Minister to reply. 
I would agree. E-scooters and e-bikes are um, absolutely the way forward. And as I said, we'll be here for a long time. And I understand exactly what the honourable member has just said. Move on to question eight. I call on the honourable member for Arbury Cast Tamalu, Mr. Morehouse. Oh, Mr. Thomas, sorry. Did sorry, you have thought, a supplementary? I thought you, I thought you acknowledged my I question. I apologise. I will allow it. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, for allowing it. So, basically, the uh, consultation was open between the 29th of January and the 12th of March 2021. Some constituents of Douglas Central engaged fully with that consultation and are uh, still very disappointed that no consultation response document has been published. Is it, uh, when will the consultation response uh, document be published? And can the, um, can the Minister advise whether it's normal practice to do a consultation and then just forget about it and, and just say that policy is being made? Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr President. I apologise if that wasn't publicised or published. Uh, I will make sure that that does go on the uh, department's portal. Uh, and there's certainly the results of those uh, will be taken into consideration when, we, when we're doing our policy uh, and coming up with... Uh, whatever it is we decide to come up with in the future, and happy to take that on board and talk to the member afterwards. Right, we now move on to question eight. Call on Honourable Member for Arby Castamalu, Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr President. I would like to ask the Minister for Infrastructure how many options for dealing with charging at the airport he has considered since January 2022, what the cost of each option, and which option is favoured by his department. Thank you. Minister for Infrastructure to reply. Mr President, the Department considered two options as part of the replacement plan for charging at the airport car park. These options were to replace the barriers and machines at an approximate cost of £250,000, which also included the service and cash handling charges, or option two, to implement a trial for an app phone charging option at an approximate cost of just over £4,150 for complete setup with no additional service charge. Based on the cost option, option two was preferred and chosen by the department. Supplementary, Mr Morehouse. Thank you very much, um, Mr President and Minister. In terms of the options looked at, there doesn't seem to be the third option in terms of a simple card reader or the same option as is currently available at Bosnet Car Park. Could you explain possibly why the field was so narrow? and why we got such a last-minute decision yesterday evening in terms of the favoured option being abandoned. Thank you, Mr President. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, Mr President, sorry. Uh, as far as the options go, uh, costs certainly came into it. it was, it's been the end of the financial year and we've been looking at it and we were trying to, we've been trying to keep the cost down. We believe what we have got uh, will work. Uh, say, we will look at it over this next year, and if it does work, which we believe it will do, um, I think it's going to be good value for money. Um, so, you just remind me of the other part of the question? Uh, just in terms of the, um, that final decision, why, why did it happen so late in the... Oh, sorry, yes. Um, yeah, I, I took the decision yesterday, Mr President, having uh, received lots of emails and uh, comments from people uh, about the system being brought in, that it would uh, another four... And to, take, to take us to the end of the week to give more time to explain it and have people understand what we, were trying, what we are bringing in. Uh, as I said this morning on Manx Radio, there was also a query at the back end of last week. Um, somebody got in touch with the Information Commissioner's office uh, and he was querying something with us, so we've been fo uh, following up that with him. And just to give it a couple more days to sort out, we thought it'd be, I thought it would be easier to leave it to the end of the week. So I apologise for any confusion there to people, but hopefully by Friday we will have the system in uh, and ready to work. Thank you. Supplementary, Mrs. Kane. Thank you, Mr. President. Could I query when the Minister says they went for the, the preferred option as the best value for money, um, whether any percentage will go to the app provider for every transaction, or in fact there, there is no additional service charge, so once installed, all that income would go to the Department? Minister to reply. There is a small percentage, Mr. President, uh, which goes to the. Um, the app provider, if you like. I apologise, I don't have that figure with me. It is, into the, it is pennies per each transaction, and that will come out of the transaction rather than uh, be added to the, uh, the person using the app, if you like. So all costs, what you, what you pay is, uh, is what you pay, and there's no extra hidden charges in that, if I can put it like that. I, I will circulate that to members as well, Mr President. Thank you, Mr Callister. Thank you, Mr President. My question is on the similar line for my colleague from Garth. The Minister said that the Ringo app was the one that was preferred, it offers good value for money. 
He also said in their statement from the department that there'd be no increase to the person using the service. But again, this morning, um, he's a little bit um, vague on the information of who actually pays the third party. Can we just clarify that? For every pound that someone pays into the system via the app, how much of it goes to the third party and who pays the additional costs? If you could just clarify those points, please. Minister, to reply. Not vague at all, Mr. President. What I said was whatever the uh, customer pays, if it's a pound or two pounds, they pay that. There is a small percentage that comes out of that that will go to the provider of the app. Uh, and I have not got that, and I will circulate that to honourable members as soon as I can, Mr. President. Final supplementary, Mr. Morehouse. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I recognise the Department likes to challenge, but in terms of the favoured system, there seems to be a lot of challenges with it. Um, it's widely publicised that um, Trustpilot made reference to 94% for the last 568 mm -hmm. comments being in the worst category, in the bad category. Given that situation, what evidence has the department got to reassure us that this is the breakthrough system that it really believes is right for the island at this time? Thank you, Mr. President. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. The department or the officers looked around at other apps that were available. Uh, and yes, I'm well aware of what trust pilots have, uh, are saying on theirs, but there are others that are also saying that Ringo is very good. And indeed, as I said this morning on the radio, there was somebody that phoned up that had spent four years in London using nothing but, I think, Ringo uh, car parks, and he said he never had a problem in those four years. You're damned if you do, and you're damned if you don't, Mr. President. We had to make a choice. The officers have made the choice. I'm quite happy to try that for the year. And if it doesn't work, then we'll look at it again during that year. Moving on to question nine, a call on the Honourable Member for Middle, Mr Peters. <coughs> Thank you very much, Mr President. I beg leave to ask the Minister for Infrastructure on a similar note uh, how an unsuitable barrier system was previously purchased for the airport car park and what it cost. Minister for Infrastructure to reply. Thank you, Mr President. The existing car parking system, including the barriers, was installed in phases from 2007 and has been in successful service for many years. Due to the age of the barrier system, the Department had begun to process to, the process to, de to find a suitable alternative. However, during 2020, the barriers were taken out of service to allow convenient and free access for the public to attend the vaccination hub created at the airport. Unfortunately, without regular use, the barrier became inoperable. The original cost of the barrier system was approximately £100,000 across all phases. Supplementary, Mr Peters. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, given that the outgoing system lasted so long, from 2007 apparently, and helped generate such a substantial revenue, even though it was allegedly a mistake, it must have paid for itself many times over. So why was it allowed to fail completely, and why did the Department not maintain it properly, routinely replacing worn-out components in a timely manner? Thank you, sir. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. I think the, uh, the answer to that is it, it was working very well up until uh, COVID hit and then when we started using the airport as a hub the barriers were left up for something in the region of about 18 months they weren't maintained during that time I don't believe they were ever put down in that time and when it came to use them again earlier this year they would seized and absolutely uh, broken need replacing supplementary Mr Morehouse Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> Given that people have gone into the car park, the barriers haven't been there. We have the reassurance this morning about no current charges. There's a possibility that at one minute past midnight on Friday, that people are going to have to start paying. <coughs> How will that transition be managed? If I leave my car there today and pick it up in six months' time, wow. will I get away without any charges at all? In the Thank dish. you, Mr. President. Minister to reply. Mr President, he certainly will not get away with it. <laughs> the man whose parking habits are widely known. <laughs> I'll get you back. <laughs> Mr President, seriously, uh, there has been warnings given out to honourable members to, uh, to people using <laughs> sorry, not honourable members, to people using the car park. Um, when this comes in. People in the car park, the cars in the car park will be checked. We know who will be in there come, this, come the day. And then after that, anybody going in there that's new will be expected to use the, the facilities down there and pay for them. Those that are already there will get a warning you know, that we know that um, basically we knew they were there before and they won't be charged. But anybody that is using it and doesn't pay will be charged. Supplementary, Mr. Peters. Thank you, Mr. President. 
I appreciate that we're moving towards being a cashless society and having to use a card to spend a penny, but I believe that the Ringo parking app chosen by the department has a huge, I think uh, the Honourable Member across talked about 94%, I thought it was more like 97%, disapproval rating from public users in the UK. So this isn't just the occasional person who thinks it's good. 97% of users, as I understand it, think that it's very bad. In the last couple of days, what was a done deal has been scaled back to a six-month trial, maybe reviewed after three months, and only yesterday was postponed following public comments. Mm. Why did the department not use the AMPR system already installed successfully at certainly the Shaw's Brow and Bottleneck car parks? Thank yeah, you, sir. Yeah. Minister, to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, as far as the, uh, the done deal is concerned, I think, I think I've answered the bit about the 97. I think you're right. I think it was 97%, not 94%. I'm quite happy to admit that. Um, I think the done deal is we've got it on trial. For, it's here for a year. We can give six months' notice if we find something better or we find it's not working, so we can get out of it with six months' notice. That's not an issue. Um, AMPR was looked at. Ringo can be adapted to accept AMPR, so if it's acceptable and it works, uh, come next year we can en enhance the system by putting in AMPR, which I actually would, would have preferred. There is an issue with that which has to go through the ICO, the Information Commissioner's Office, uh, and we were talking to him at the time about this, and we will continue to do so over the next year. And it may well be it's a better system and works better, in which case we'll, uh, we'll look to enforce that. There is, uh, bring that in rather. But there is a cost implication to AMPR, much bigger than what we have at the moment. But we will look at it during the next six to 12 months. <coughs> Long and winding way. On a supplementary, Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr President. At the moment, there's no need for parking attendants. Who will carry out this role? And are they currently in place? And what will the level of fines be? Thank you, Mr President. Volunteering. Minister to reply. If <laughs> <laughs> I with a bit of help from you, friends. My honourable colleague just beat me to that. I thought there was a volunteer there to do that because he spends so much time at the airport. Mr. Moore has. Um, we will have officers walking around with, obviously, there's a machine that can tell whether the car was logged on or not, and uh, we'll have officers walking around. So, you know, if somebody wants to take that chance and try and get away with it, that's up to them. Uh, but otherwise, there will be people checking on it. We move on to question 10. Honourable Member for Arbury Castamalu, Mr. Moorhouse. Thank you, Mr. President. I would like to ask the Minister for the Cabinet Office what A, financial support, and B, safeguarding measures are in place to assist people from the Ukraine. Thank you. Minister for the Cabinet Office to reply. Thank you, um, Mr. President. I thank the Honourable Member for his question. In answer to Part A, Ukrainian guests arriving into the Isle of Man through the current schemes will have access to a range of benefits from arrival. These will, to a certain extent, depend on their particular circumstances and may include job seekers' allowance, income support, or employed <coughs> for example. Those eligible for child benefits will also be able to claim that. The second part of the Honourable Member's question is, is very important. As we said from the start, our overarching priority has, to be, has been to ensure that any Ukrainian coming to the Isle of Man can receive a warm welcome in a safe environment. And the basis on which officers were asked to act was that um, we should be making sure things are safe and successful. Therefore, our version of the Homes for Ukraine scheme includes important checks that include police checks, other safeguarding checks, and checks on the property being offered to guests. Thank you, Mr. President. Supplementary, Mr. Morehouse. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Minister, for that reassuring answer. In terms of the checks that have been taking place, they've been really welcomed. But my real concern is once the residents arrive in someone else's home, is there any mechanism in place for them then to raise a concern? Or are they expected to use the normal channels such as the police and other devices that are in place for, for the residents? Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, to reply. Thank you, um, Mr. President. Um, it, it would be the case that, that um, Ukrainians that come here that would absolutely be encouraged to, to raise the th issues through the normal cha uh, channels, but I would emphasise that there is, there is information <coughs> that is provided specifically to hosts and Ukrainians arriving here so that they can access help and um, government services. And part of that is also about making sure that there is that community connection, for example, with the third sector and also with the Ukrainian, the Ukrainian community on the Isle of Man. So I think that that sort of closest of proximity and um, upfront information should really help where, should an issue arise, that, that people do not feel isolated and that they know where to go. Um, 
I think part of the initial process on this that we've put in place over here, which obviously I think there has been some criticism in, in the, the schemes elsewhere, um, is to make sure that we have coordinated safeguarding checks in the first instance to, make, to try and make sure that things are, are in order. Um, for example, for Ireland residents um, to be registered as a host for the Homes for Ukraine scheme, they must agree to various checks to be undertaken, and these checks include an Isle of Man constabulary check and a DHSC registrations and inspections check. And if uh, the above checks on the host and any household members are, are, are approved, then a DEFA will complete a home visit check to ensure the property where the Ukrainian guests are due to be hosted uh, meets their relevant standards. Um, Prospective hosts can only be registered for the Homes for Ukraine scheme if all through the safeguarding checks have been approved. Um, and I think that hopefully that answers the question so far. Thank you, Mr. President. Supplementary, Mr. Callister. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. President. Can I thank the Minister for her statement this morning? In respect of the checks carried out, can I just ask the Minister to clarify that the checks can the, um, the Isle of Man government carry out checks beyond the Isle of Man and the UK databases? Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I can advise that if uh, any of the Ukrainian guests are a child or a vulnerable ad adult, DBS checks will be carried out for hosts and any other household members who are 16 or over. Um, these DBS checks are carried out by CareCheck, who can provide a fast response. And if the DBS is not satisfactory, the host will have their registration from the Homes for Ukraine scheme removed, and another registered host will have a DBS check. Thank you, Mr. President. Supplementary, Laura. Uh, could I add extra? And if I could perhaps move back to part A of the, the question. Um, firstly, in regards to the information that the Cabinet Office will be issuing to Ukrainians arriving on the Isle of Man, um, will the Minister undertake to include some information to ensure that they're aware that their local MHKs are there for them to help navigate the system? Because I think we would all like to show our support in individual ways uh, in order to assist. And, and secondly, whilst very much supportive of the um, initiatives that the Minister talked about in terms of financial support, um, have changes to legislation been required to extend eligibility of those benefits to people who, who have arrived on the island with no national insurance number and no contributions history, or is that something that would be available to anyone coming to the Isle of Man? Minister to reply. Um, thank you, Mr President. Um, it is specific. It's, been, it's had specific consideration for Ukrainians arriving on, on this scheme. Um, I, I don't have the specific information which would be handled on the Treasury front um, in front of me. Um, I think it is a, it's, um, it's, a, it's a valid um, point to make the point to, to people that uh, arrive into the Ukrainian uh, scheme that they may make contact with their MHKs if they wish. However, I think the, the point is a lot of this stuff is about um, the system, if you like, learning uh, as it goes along. Therefore, the clear indication has been um, to uh, really keep emphasising, this has gone out in public messaging, that um, if there are any questions or issues to put that out, uh, put that in the first instant to the Ukraine support team, because that team is actively helping people navigate the system and also when the same sort of issues come up, then we can use that to, be, to feed into updated um, welcome packs and additional support for Ukrainian guests. So um, with that, um, the welcome guide that has been produced to welcome Ukrainian guests and provide them with useful information about the Isle of Man um, includes an overview of um, what life is like on the island, including our relationship with the UK, the currency that is used, the language you speak, the climate and landscape and what the island has to offer, local information which is being added to and improved all the time, um, in including um, an overview of um, banking facilities, the transport system and general infrastructure, including mobile phone services, information about getting settled here, getting out and about, rights and responsibilities and useful contacts. Um, the, Ukrainian, the Ukraine support team is, is available throughout the week on the, the email address ukrainesupport.gov.im and, and by phone to 642500. In the development of this, there has been... Um, there's been advice taken on all of these points. Thank you, Mr. President. Supplementary, Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Mr. President, and to the um, Minister for the obvious enthusiasm and diligence that she's applying to this, uh, this situation. Three times the uh, Minister has used the word guests, which is a sort of word that's got connotations in different places about when people arrive in certain places. I have in mind things like Gastar, Biter. So can the, um, can the uh, minister confirm the, the context in which she uses the word guests? Is she saying it's a guest in somebody's house or is she saying it's a guest temporarily in the Isle of Man? What, what does she mean by the use of the word guests? Secondly, um, 
Secondly, uh, building on the question from uh, Mr Speaker, uh, can the um, Minister undertake to circulate the legislation on which these uh, benefit payments are made? Is it Westminster legislation that's been applied in, um, in the Isle of Man? Um, and uh, secondly, would um, a Syrian refugee or displaced person, for instance, be able to take advantage of this same uh, opportunity to incur benefits in the Isle of Man or not? And thirdly, can the um, Minister just confirm what I think she said, which is that the, um, the properties are being expected um, fully by the Department of Environment and Food and Agriculture. It's not sort of some Maekwondo arrangement that the DfE uses for homestays or something like that. It's a proper, thorough um, DEFA, -E DEFA, um, home inspection, you know, fire service involved and so on. It's the whole works. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr President. Um, it, it is the... the it's an appropriate set, set of checks carried out absolutely by DEFA. That's had some thought. Um, the um, relevant Treasury regulations, I can, I can look into and pick, pick up with Treasury on that. I think it's been clear from the start that this has been about, um, this is a scheme that's been set out for Ukrainian refugees. So that's the basis on which this has been developed out and operating. And um, I take the, take the point about the, the, the terms used. I think there has been other sensitivity about other... other other terms used as well, so I think that's kind of where, where, we've, where we've landed at the moment in, in building this out. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, supplementary, Mr Warehouse. Thank you, Mr President. Um, I've asked previously about the financial support for the incredible people who are opening up their homes for these individuals, um, but the government website still states a potential financial assistance for hosts is under consideration. <coughs> when will this announcement arrive? Thank you very much, Mr President. Minister to reply. Thank you, uh, Mr President. Um, if there are people that are hosting that are experiencing some difficulties on this on this matter, um, and um, you know they are very, being very very generous in, in hosting, and we've been humbled by the generosity of the Manx public in that. If there are people that are hosting who are finding themselves under financial pressure as a result of hosting, some funding is available, and they should contract, contact the Ukraine support team for further information. Thank you, Mr President. We move on to question 11. A call on the Honourable Member for Russian, Dr Hayward. Thank you, Mr President. I'd like to ask the Minister for Education, Sport and Culture how and when reception children with additional education needs are assessed and how additional support is provided to them during their reception year. Minister for Education, Sport and Culture to reply. Thank you, Mr President. All children's needs are assessed as part of the transition process into reception. This transition process varies depending on the individual school or preschool setting, but it generally takes place in the summer term leading into their, re their reception year. If there are additional needs identified, these will be shared with the school beforehand so that appropriate measures can be put in place. All children are given a reception baseline assessment against the early years foundation stage framework within the first half term of their reception year. Schools use this baseline to assess any additional needs and implement strategies to address these within the school setting. If the needs are identified as requiring more specialist support, schools can then refer to other serv desk services such as the educational psychology team or specialist provision centres and or use the pathways into the Manx Care services. Children who are assessed through the Manx Care or the Preschool Assessment Centre prior to starting school will have their needs identified and, if appropriate, support will be put in place when they start school. The Preschool Assessment Centre will begin the transition process for children in the summer term prior to starting school, liaising with parents, schools and specialist provision centres as required. In addition to this, child daycare providers and schools are invited to the transition events and meetings to plan for their provision and transition into school. Thank you, Mr President. Supplementary, Dr Hayward. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, the Minister, for that answer. Can I ask her how long the waiting time is for the referral to the educational psychologist team uh, within that reception year? Because obviously it's important to establish for those children that they're getting the support as soon as they need it entering the school environment. Minister, to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the member for that question. I don't have the um, exact detail with me today. Um, obviously, that's working with Manx Care, so I'm happy to circulate that. Supplementary, Dr. Hayward. Thank you. And further to that, can I ask uh, when children are identified, sometimes later in reception year, is there additional funding available, or is the funding just a one hit in the year option? And if that window is missed, that there's no further funding to support that? <coughs> 
Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. Schools are responsible for monitoring the provision within their settings and for ensuring that the needs are met. If they have any concerns with this, they, are, they can call on specialist support and advice from the department to help them achieve the outcomes for the student. Final supplementary, Dr. Hewitt. Sorry, it was specifically over when funding windows were open for that additional support. It's not about necessarily accessing the, um, the personnel, but it's being able to access the support to allow those measures to be put in the class. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, with regards to the funding for, for primary education, um, obviously, and additional needs, there is funding available, and that is provided to the individual schools as is needed for the individual student. Move on to question 12. I call on the Honourable Member for Russian, Dr. Hayward. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I'd like to ask the uh, Minister for Education, Sport and Culture how many joint union health and safety committee meetings have taken place this year? Minister for Education, Sport and Culture to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. A joint union education forum is arranged for the 17th of June. This will involve all unions, teachers, lecturers, Unite and Prospect. Previous teachers' joint union meetings where health and safety was discussed took place on the 15th of May 2020, 7th of May 21, and the 22nd of March 22. As advised in the House of Keys in February, work is ongoing to establish a joint union's health and safety committee. The department met with union representatives in March to discuss what this committee may look like, and work continues to, to develop this. It should be acknowledged that the Department does have a robust health and safety policy and process in place which already allows for monthly updates to be provided to the Department in relation to health and safety matters in our schools. Health and safety issues are largely addressed through regular school business such as at staff meetings and department meetings. We continue to work with the recognised unions to understand how an additional meeting with them would best integrate into the current well-established process. Thank you, Mr President. Supplementary, Dr. Hayward. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'd like to ask the Minister further to the meeting that happened in March. Have the terms of reference been developed and when those might be available? Thank you. Minister to reply. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. As I've said in, in my answer, um, obviously the representatives met in March to discuss this and the work's continuing to develop. As of yet, I haven't seen any terms of reference at the Department, but we work closely with the unions and will come forward with the right appropriate. Um, way forward for health and safety, but if the Honourable Member has any concerns or is aware of any concerns, please, please let me know. All of our um, people and teachers, support staff in our schools know how to report any health and safety issues. Yeah, move on to question 13. A call on the Honourable Member for Douglas North, Mr Wannenberg. Thank you, Mr President. Could I ask the Minister for Education, Sport and Culture how long the mobile classroom at Winston School has been in place, what plans she has for it, whether she thinks it is fit for purpose, and if she will make a statement. Thank you. Minister for Education, Sport and Culture to reply. Thank you, Mr President. Myself and the Chief Executive from the Department visited Wilston School to view the double mobile classroom last Monday. The mobile classroom installation predates our records, but it is evident that it has been in place for many years. And I will advise the Honourable Member, it's definitely been there for more than 40 because that was my school and it wasn't there then, so um, it's definitely over 40 years. The double mobile classroom is not currently used for classrooms, but it is occasionally used for school group activities including yoga, music, design technology and storage. In 2019, the Department planned to replace this mobile classroom at Williston Primary School with a newer double mobile classroom and had planning approval in place. However, due to changing priorities, the mobile classroom was installed on an alternative site as a priority. The Department has met with the Department of Infrastructure to establish what can be done to improve the condition of the mobile, to improve its external appearance and the internal environment in order to sustain its use by the school for a further period, pending any agreement on replacement or new development at the school. Thank you, Mr. President. Supplementary, Mr. Wallenberg. Thank you, Mr. President. Could I ask... Um, does the Minister think that she will again change her priorities and put Williston Mobile Classroom back on the top of the list? Thank you. Minister to reply. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Um, obviously, I know the Honourable Member has visited the Mobile as well and is in 
poor condition. Um, however, the school does have a need for it, so the priority is to make sure that's maintained to, to a standard that can be used. Um, and as I've said in previous sittings, I think a strategic infrastructure needs assessment for the east should be a priority, and we should not be in putting any more mobile classrooms. We should be making sure that the school estate is appropriate and fit for use for the ongoing you know, 20, 30 years. Thank you, Mr. President. Supplementary, Mr. Ashford. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, and can I start by thanking the Minister and the CEO for the department for going up and visiting Williston School. I know it was very much appreciated. Uh, would the Minister agree with me that mobile should only ever be considered a temporary solution and that once you pass the first four decades, um, a, more, um, a more permanent solution is slightly overdue? Um, so would the Minister, as, as I'm sure she has already indicated, um, agree with me that another more permanent solution needs to be found? And who knows? perhaps um, after their life is expended, uh, Manx National Heritage might take them on as an historic artefact. <laughs> Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr President. And yes, totally agree. Um, you know, it, it's, it is evident from the Williston School Mobile that perhaps the change shouldn't have took place in 2019. However, as an ex-student walking around that school, the atmosphere and the ethos of the school was still the same, and it was great to see, but there was also another mobile on the site, so I do think a strategic review of that site and what needs to be there to replace it. Obviously, we know that takes time, but we need to make sure the facilities are fit for purpose now. Supplementary, Mr Morehouse. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. President. <clears throat> Does the Department have a specific policy on the use of mobile classrooms, or is each situation looked at separately? And is it only looked at when a concern is raised? Or is the department actually looking at this as a wide-ranging review? Thank you, Mr. President. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. Yes, there's a, a full review of the education estate taking place. Um, I've commenced that. Um, and certainly, you know, there's 10 mobile classrooms on Balakameen High School in the east. That is not appropriate. We need to look at where, at, at, we, you know, we need to look at catchment areas and make sure that the facilities our students are in. However, we won't be able to replace all mobiles overnight. It will be a plan, and I, you know, I will come forward with a strategic plan for the properties. Supplementary, so Mr. Thomas. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and I appreciate the um, the minister visiting some other schools that uh, have derelict. Uh, parts to them and excessive uh, use of mobile, sta uh, mobile classrooms when she was visiting Williston. Is the Minister excited by the fact that Treasury is carrying out a strategic infrastructure needs assessment by December 2022? And, and, and does the Minister agree with me that it would be excellent to actually have a prioritised need for investment in, um, in, in schools completed by December 2022 between Treasury and the Department for Education, Sport and Culture? Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr President. And yes, obviously I've been working with Treasury colleagues with regards to the requirements for education um, and hopefully you know, there will be something complete by 2022 if Treasury have agreed um, and certainly with um, one of the officers in Treasury that education would um, take priority. Um, however, I think we need to look at where the priorities lie and look at that in regions you know, south east, north and west, and come up with solutions. Final supplementary, Mr Mercer. Thank you, Mr President. Um, given the age of some of these mobile classrooms, can the Minister reassure us that there's no asbestos uh, still in, uh, in any of these units? Yes. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr President. I know the Department, um, certainly in the last 15 years, made sure that all schools had asbestos removed. I would have expected that to happen on the mobiles, but I'll certainly check to make sure that is the case. And on to question 14. Honourable Member for Arbury Castamalu, Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr President. I would like to ask the Minister for Enterprise what factors influence the opening times of Manx National Heritage attractions in Castletown? Thank you. Minister for Enterprise to reply. Mr President, I would like to thank the Honourable Member for his question. Manx National Heritage has provided me the following response. In planning the opening of all its sites, Manx National Heritage takes into account a number of factors. Opening hours are programmed to balance demand and resources, both financial and staffing, across all sites and services. 
in order to balance the available resources, Manx National Heritage provides seven-day opening for the sites with the greatest demand and offers bookable tours for those with the lowest footfall. For sites with lower demand, which include a number of smaller sites in Castletown, five-day opening is supported at the Grove and Russian Abbey, while the remaining sites at the Old House of Keys, the Peggy, Nautical Museum and the Old Grammar School are available to book. Thank you. Supplementary, Mr Marhouse. Thank you, Mr President, and thank you, Minister. Um, the seven-day opening of Castle Russian is really, really welcomed, as they have been pushing for for ages. Um, the problem is it doesn't seem to be advertised very well. There is information on Max National Heritage's website, but it's clunky, it's dated, and itself, it's a historical item. Could the actual promotions be looked at and reconsidered, please? Thank you. Minister's reply. Thank you, Mr President. And, and I, I disagree with the Honourable Member. I think the Manx National um, Heritage website isn't clunky at all. It's very interactive. It's got maps there, some very good views, and actually advertises what happens right across our island, not just in Castletown. Um, but going further in, in terms of the Honourable Member's question, there is a huge n um, amount of promotion going on, both for um, the, those sites in Castletown, but also right across our island, including social media platforms, the website, promotion via, via industry partners such as Visit Isle of Man and Isle of Man Railways, and also um, the printed materials available at the Welcome Centre, hotels, self-catering accommodation, the tram stations, the railway shop, the Isle of Man Airport steam packet, on board vessels, and also travel agents and operators. Furthermore, the um, Manx National Heritage sites are promoted off-island at the World Travel Market and British Tourism and Travel Show. Thank you. Final supplementary, Mr Morehouse. Thank you, Mr President, and thank you, Minister, for that interesting answer, reassuring many aspects. Um, there was a slight concern there regarding the website. I had personal issues with it this morning, and I did copy you in in terms of actually clarity in certain areas. Um, with regard to the opening of existing facilities, various items were identified as part of the answer. In terms of solutions, are solutions able to be found? Are we, are, are we going to continue working with the restrictions we have? And in terms of the wider aspect, we've got the target of 500,000 people coming to the island. And Manx National Heritage is going to be key to that. And Castletown is a shining beacon. Is the <laughs> department going to make more use of these facilities in enabling us to move forward? Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, to reply. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And, and I thank the Honourable Member for his email earlier on, and he was unfortunately looking at the wrong website. But can I also remind him <laughs> and, perhaps, and perhaps give a little bit of publicity to the Castletown Heritage Site Tours, which I think are fairly unique where there is a two-hour tour of all the Manx National Heritage um, sites, meeting at Castle Russian and then heading over to the Nautical Museum, followed by sitting at the Old House of Keys and a trip to the Old Grammar School every Saturday from the 2nd of April. And perhaps he and other um, uh, Timbal members would like to take advantage of this amazing um, example of uh, you know, guided tours around some of our classical sites um, in the south of the island. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Question 15. I call on you. Uh, I did the final supplementary. Question 15. Is, is it this possible is, to raise the point forward, no. though, please? Mr. Morehouse, please resume your seat. Uh, you now have the opportunity to ask your question on, on question 15 to the Minister for Enterprise. Um, with, with, thank you, Mr. President. With, with regard to the website, there was the issue that an alternative website became available using the Google search that the CEO of Manx National Heritage wasn't aware of. Uh, so the minister, please confirm My, my question's Thank paper you. here says the question 15 is about uh, the high street shops. Yes, yes, Mr. President. You have just asked that question? Could I ask that, please, Mr. President? Please do. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. I would like to ask the Minister for Enterprise what options have been considered to resolve issues associated with high street shops being empty for more than 12 months. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. For Enterprise, to reply. Mr. President, the retail, hospitality and leisure sectors that typically make up most of the high street have already confronted significant challenges as a result of COVID-19. These sectors are on the road to recovery, but now face increased pressure due to inflation and staff shortages. 
Unfortunately, these are not just local issues. They're faced by industry across the UK and the rest of the world. Unit vacancies have increased in many places as large brands have closed down. Some of this decline has impacted the island, but due to the strength of our independent retailers, perhaps fewer businesses have closed locally than in comparative areas across. Fortunately, over the past few months, we have seen some instances where existing businesses are investing to expand, as well as new ventures operating in both retail and hospitality. It should also be noted that the Department can provide support to new retail, hospitality and leisure businesses through the Micro-Business micro Grant Scheme. We also support improvements in the existing appearance of businesses and public amenities in town centres via the Town and Village Regeneration Scheme. Nonetheless, the Department is aware that there is a need to re-energise town centres to create vibrancy and build great communities as set out in our island plan. The Treasury Minister has already mentioned the Empty Property Initiative, which has been pr proposed by the Housing and Communities Board. With respect to empty shops, through the Business Agency, the Department is supporting the work of a new build, built, sorry, built Environment Reform Programme, which will consider the future of our local high streets. More specifically, the Department has been reviewing Scotland's adoption of the Town Centre First Principle. I anticipate that as this work stream develops, the public will see a number of actions come forward that will join together local authorities, business and government to put renewed emphasis on the importance of supporting our town centres and villages. We recognise the importance of this complex issue and continue to work across government and the private sector to explore what we can do to energise our high streets and ensure that they are vibrant and sustainable. Thank you. Supplementary, Mr. Mohas. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Minister. In the adjacent island, additional options are currently being looked at, including landlords who had empty properties for over 12 months should be forced to accept, accept tenants on short term leases and on lower rents. Is this something that could be considered on the island man? Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. There, is no government, there are no government plans to force landlords to accept tenants. Thank you. Supplementary, Mr. Mohat. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, in terms of the options that have been done, in the initial answer, the Minister is quite clear in terms of there was a range of options available. But in terms of focusing them towards new businesses going on the high street, is there any specific emphasis being placed on that? Because we have a situation now where an increasing number of shops in certain areas are empty, and that is starting to have an impact on the wider environment. Thank you very much. To reply. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And I thank the Honourable Member for, for his question. Again, there is anecdotal evidence of increased numbers of vacant properties, and that's certainly something that the Business Agency is looking at, as well as doing some work in terms of footfall of those areas to see how we can maximise the return for people to reopen those shops and create new business opportunities. Thank you. May I move on to question 16, calling the Honourable Member for Arby Castanamalu, Mr. Glover. Thank you very much, Dr. I'd like to ask the Chair of the Office of Fair Trading how customers of builders can complain about poor standards of work and seek to recover costs. Chairman of the Office of Fair Trading to reply. Thank you, Mr. President. And I thank the Member for Arbury, Castletown and Malou for his question. Customers of builders can complain to the Office of Fair Trading if the matter is a criminal one, for example, charging for work that has not been undertaken, then it will be dealt with by our trading standards. Our consumer advice section deals with matters that are civil, for example, shoddy workmanship. It is not always obvious from the outset as to whether a particular matter is criminal or civil. Indeed, some may be a combination of the two. So aggrieved customers should initially contact the consumer advice section on telephone 686 500 or by email. The consumer advice section will provide appropriate advice on how to take a complaint further, including how to take civil action. It is incumbent on the aggrieved customer, and not the Office of Fair Trading, to take civil action. Details of court procedures can be found on the Isle of Man Courts of Justice website. Some businesses may be members of a trade association or accreditation scheme, or something similar offering alternate dispute resolution services, such as mediation. If available, these alternatives of going to court will generally be outlined on the association or scheme website. 
If there is a criminal element to the matter, then it will generally be dealt with by the, standard, by the Trading Standards Section, who will investigate it under relevant Trading Standards legislation, such as the Consumer Protection for, from Unfair Trading Regulations 2019. This does not preclude the aggrieved customer from taking a civil action. <coughs> An investigation by the Trading Standards Section could ultimately lead to a criminal prosecution. It is not unknown, but by no means routine for a criminal court to make an award of financial <coughs> compensation in favour of the aggrieved customer if the defendant is found guilty. I must make clear that a successful civil action or criminal prosecution does not guarantee that an aggrieved customer will be fully compensated financially, or indeed compensated at all in the case of a criminal prosecution, as that is ultimately up to the court to rule on that award. Thank you. Supplementary, Mr Glover. Here am I, Dr N. I have a constituent in Castletown uh, who's having a property renovated and extended. However, the builder walked out in the middle of, of this, and uh, there were substantial and significant uh, errors found and overcharging identified. I've been in that house, and even to my untrained eye, it's an absolute botch job. So far, my constituent has spent £70,000 in building reports and legal and professional fee fees attempting to have the builder accept liability and to recover costs and have found that building control uh, and the office of fair trading were unable to help. They've also had no help at all either from Construction Isle of Man. Are there plans to bring in a register of licensed builders in the Isle of Man and indeed an ombudsman to deal with situations like this. It's simply not good enough what we've got at the moment. Chairman to reply. Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, I thank the uh, honourable member as well. Obviously, I cannot comment on an individual case. Uh, what I would be happy to do is refer this to the head of the OFT to compare what we do <coughs> to other jurisdictions, and we can put forward a paper for consideration by the board. Thank you. Move on to question 17. I call on the Honourable Member for Russian, Dr Hayward. Uh, thank you, Mr President. <coughs> I'd like to ask the Minister for Infrastructure what assistance has been offered by his department to the Queen's Pier Restoration Project. Yeah. Call on the Minister for Infrastructure <laughs> to reply. <coughs> thank you, Mr President. <laughs> <coughs> the department's maintenance obligations are limited to inspecting the pier including the legs, the department may at its discretion undertake remedial works as are deemed necessary to maintain the pier in no worse of a condition than as were at the commencement of the lease, which was granted to the Queen's Pier Restoration Trust in August 2021. However, the, department division, the department's harbour division does offer assistance to the Queen's Pier Restoration Trust as and when time and resources allow. To date, assistance has involved some occasional work with the blacksmiths, for example, the Harbours Division has recently put some stanchions and lampposts through the forge to remove the rust and made some alterations to steel joists on the main length of the uh, on the main joist steel joists on the main length of the pier. Can I just take this opportunity to also congratulate uh, the trustees and the helpers and all those that financially support this wonderful trust? Supplementary, Dr. Hayward. Uh, thank the Minister for that answer, and, and he's indeed right that, that it's not necessarily about uh, financial uh, assistance that I was asking. Uh, can I ask about the progress of the uh, space at the side of the entranceway, and it was being deregistered as a highway and the lease is being prepared to hand over, and how far the Department's got with that? Minister to reply. Mr President, I have absolutely no idea, but I will find out and let honourable members know. Thank you. Supplementary, Mrs Kane. Thank you, Mr President. Um, I also commend the work that the, the Trust is uh, t undertaking at the pier. Could I ask the Minister to confirm that prior to the Trust taking on the refurbishment of Queen's Pier, the Department had a maintenance budget, I think it amounted to around £50,000 per annum, in their books for their maintenance of the pier um, to prevent it falling down. So is there any consideration that that amount might be made available to the um, the charity that's restoring it in order to um, enable them to do more restoration work on the pier. Minister to reply. Thank you very much, Mr President. As nice as it would be, I doubt it was uh, possible at all. I'm sure the reason why we're in the situation we are at the moment is the Department, and I remember it well, under Minister Gorn's time, 
when the department could no longer afford to maintain it and it was looked and priced up to uh, demolish the pier. And, and uh, as a result of that, some years later, the trusts came about and are doing the good work they are. But uh, at the moment, I would suggest there's uh, no money, and certainly in the budget for the, from the department, to give anything to the trust at all. Call on the um, question 18 on the Honourable Member for Douglas South, Mrs Mulpey. Who am I acting around? Just when you thought airport parking couldn't be spoken about any long further, I'm going to raise to ask my question, and that is uh, whether free Wi-Fi will be provided in all airport car parks to enable customers to use the car parking app, <coughs> and what alternatives there will be for customers without a mobile device. Minister for Infrastructure to reply. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. President. The air car, airport car parks do not provide Wi-Fi. However, there is free Wi-Fi in the terminal building, as the car park offers free disc parking for the first hour. And I would actually take this opportunity to remind members now: it is the whole of the car park, and not just that small piece nearer to the uh, terminal building. It's the whole of the car park. As long as you have your disc up, you have a free hour, or will do from Friday. Well, it's from today, but. Uh, Everything's free from today still till Friday. <laughs> <laughs> Passengers will be able to use the free Wi-Fi within the terminal building to enable them to access the car parking app. As per the press release, anyone who does not have a smartphone can pay for their parking either by calling a number before leaving home and providing a car, par car pa card payment over the phone or sending a text message, paying online or by asking the assistance at the information desk in the airport and they'll only be too happy to help there. Move on to... Question 19. Call on the Honourable Member for Douglas North, Mr Wannamoo. Thank you, Mr President. I would like to ask the Minister for Infrastructure to what extent the Bus Drivers Working Agreement 2019 version 9 is being implemented and what the reasons are for any shortfalls in its implementation and whether duties without meal breaks or finish times are acceptable. Thank you. Minister for Infrastructure to reply. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank the Honourable Member for his question. Bus Fannin is currently operating to version 9 of the Bus Drivers Working Agreement. The trade unions are consulted on any variations to that agreement and supplemental agreements are made which includes, for example, salary, bus review, salary reviews, bus drivers employed after the 7th of September 2020 and minibus drivers employed after the 20th of July 2021 are subject to different working arrangements. There are three instances of shortfall in the implementation of the agreement. The first is when the last bus south is delayed with the extra mileage in Castletown and does not arrive, arrive at the depot by the scheduled time to which there is no alternative. Secondly, the working agreement does not allow the drivers to start before 6 o'clock in the morning or work after 20 past midnight, where there is a requirement to provide an early morning service and late buses, and as such the department has to seek volunteers to provide these services or use staff covered by the later working arrangements. Lastly, an application is pending to the RTLC to, depend, to expand sorry, demand responsive transport. It is currently being operated on a voluntary basis outside the working agreement, however. I can confirm that there are no duties that do not allow for a meal break. The only duties that do not have a predetermined finishing time are those allocated to private hire or if delays are experienced through either abnormal traffic or weather. However, there is a process within the working agreement that addresses this. I thank you. Supplementary, Mrs Christian. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, would the Minister please confirm what provisions, what are the provisions, i.e. regular access to bathrooms, facilities, um, are there for female bus drivers who are on their menstrual cycle during their shifts? Thank you, Mr President. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr President. As far as I know, at, uh, most, or at all the depots, there should be toilet facilities available. At Douglas uh, Lord Street, it's at the old police station. I would imagine that uh, Ramsey, Peel and uh, um, down south there are facilities available. Supplementary, Mr Wannenberg. Thank you, Mr President. Um, the Minister has just indicated to us that there is no shifts without meal breaks. Um, I can provide him with some shifts that don't have any meal breaks after this sitting, if you'd be care to comment <coughs> on that. Thank you. No, not a question. Final, uh, would you care to well, I'm happy to take that on board and speak to the Honourable Member afterwards, Mr President. Right. Final, Mr. final supplementary, Mrs Christian. Thank you, Mr President. What does concern me is, is that there is this evidence that there aren't access um, to um, breaks during shifts. Um, and, and specifically, if he could look into what provisions are and come back to this Honourable Court um, for female bus drivers, I think it's really important that this is adhered to. Good, work, good working policy. Thank you, Mr President. Minister. More than content to do that, Mr. President.